still young and he's still learning. And I, I kind of think that he's finding his game breaking ceiling now as a Titan at the perfect time for Tennessee. Welcome into the Hot Read Podcast, live from Boomba's Pizza here in Spring Hill, Tennessee. I'm your host, Easton Freeze, director of published content here at BroadwaySportsMedia.com. We're also brought to you by the 440 Podcast Network, and you can follow me on social media at Easton Freeze. I'm joined, as always, by producer JT. You can follow on social media at JT underscore Runky. JT, how are you? I'm good. Happy Thursday when we're recording this, Friday's episode. Week two is almost here, and I'm glad that we can move on with our lives just like Ryan Tannehill did and talk about some week two and have to stop forcefully uh, move on forcefully move on yeah. and stop talking about overreactions. But yeah, once again, we're here from boom Boz. A lot of people here, different story from last week. Of course, people are now here enjoying some of the great pizza and drinks that they have. If you hear that door, it's because there's a lot of kids outside playing on the playground and, and the door is, is a little loud. We're having, we're, a, good. we're having a lot of fun here at boom We're Boz, great. It's an awesome time. It's fantastic pizza. It's fantastic drink selection. And it's a fantastic place to watch the game. That's what we're doing every single Thursday. We are brought to you by Boomba's Pizza, Tennessee. They've got three Middle Tennessee locations here in Spring Hill, as well as East Nashville and in Murfreesboro. They've also got locations in Indiana and Kentucky, if you're from out of town. And they make some of the best pizza, JT, I've, I've ever had. We, we talk about this on every show. But they are genuinely world-renowned, decorated artists with pizza. They have won four times at the Las Vegas uh, International Pizza Expo for Best Vegetarian, Gourmet, International, and Non-Traditional Pizza. They're also the only pizza company in America to have won Best Pizza in America, not once but twice, at the International Pizza Championships. They make good pizza. It's what they do. They're professionals. And they will make pizzas for you that truly you, you've never had before. It's not just they've perfected the pepperoni pizza here. They, they make gourmet pizzas that you got to try. And I'm yet to have one. I mean, like every time we're here, I'm trying, like, I'm trying actively now to find something I don't like on the menu. Um, and I'm, I'm yet to succeed in that. Yeah, see, I, I'm totally different here. Their green chicken chili pizza is just so good that why would I get anything else? Like, we've had some of their other ones, <laughs> but right. like, it's hard for me to justify getting anything yeah. else. It's the best pizza I've ever had. Oh, I'm I'm a I'm an East Coast it's boy. The, well, so like I mean, like it's the best non-traditional pizza. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's I, the I best you. non, yeah. you know, just slice of pepperoni. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, they also have fantastic drink selection. We've got our Thursday night football branded cups here. We do. They're in on the football here at Boomba's. I'm drinking a Mayday Angry Redhead, which is delicious. What do you What do you have here? I've got the Jackalope Bear Walker Maple Stout, which is very delicious. Tried it for the first time last week. I think we're making Stony Keely proud today. I, we got to get Stoney out here eventually. Need, he would he would love this to. place. Stoney, if you're watching or if you're listening later, we're, we're going to drag you out here eventually. It's a long season, so we'll find a day. Um, if you're watching with us live, appreciate you tuning in with us before Thursday Night Football. We are previewing Titans Chargers. Week two home opener here in Nashville. The Titans looking to get off the schneid, get back on their horse, and get their first win in well, what will be nine attempts coming up this Sunday. A lot to talk about regarding that. Some matchups of strength and weakness that I'd like to highlight. And then I want to talk about the game plan this team is going to have on both sides of the ball, but in particular offensively, how I think it might be different and how I think it, it's going to look the same this week based on what I've heard at the Titans facility, talking to coaches and players this week. And also we'll, we'll take a, a little bit of a deep dive into what this Chargers team managed to do last week and what was really one of the only games of the week in the week one slate that, that had competent, offense on both sides of the ball if that that game looked like offenses in midseason form the rest of the league was kind of a disaster I, and, and on the on the other side of the ball i think it was competent offense maybe less than competent defense oh, absolutely. and then if you want to take it a step defense, farther yes. maybe it was competent offense on the charger side and then a competent uh Tua to tyreek hill connection just to it just um, two guys two <laughs> so, competent guys fair enough you know to each their own i would say to but, each their but own. definitely this is a bigger matchup, I think, for the Titans. You look at a, a New Orleans Saints kind of team that had an offense that, I mean, without Alvin Kamara, they have some pieces right there. A lot of question marks, I think, though, versus a Los Angeles Chargers team 
who has the known commodities. You have Justin Herbert, who just signed a mega deal. You have an Austin, Austin Eckler, which may not. We'll get to that later. But then you have the kind of triple threat in the in the wide receiver room now with Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, who was always a tough matchup for these Titans secondary guys, and then the new guy in Quentin Johnson. So it's going to be a different kind of test for the Titans, I think, this week. I agree. Before we dive into all of that, and then the best bet gauntlet to cap things off, we uh, we started collectively six and four. We did start the season, which as we talk about week one is a nightmare to bet. Uh, I, I take my three and two. I think you take your three and two and we run to week two. I do. I was hoping I was holding out hope for the Giants to get that, uh, that in, in, the, in the in the for, literally in like the first six you say minutes. holding out hope. What? Yeah, for about five for the minutes. six minutes. And then right. they, they returned the field goal block for a touchdown. And then it was just no hope. And I was like, OK, I'm still yeah. above 500. So, yeah. you know, I'm taking it. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, before we dive into the Titans Chargers preview, if you're watching with us live, do us a favor, share the show, send the link to somebody. You can hit that like button, hit the repost or retweet button. That would be very helpful. Consider it a personal favor. And then if you're watching with us on Twitter or on Facebook, head on over to Broadway Sports Media on YouTube. While you're there, hit the subscribe button because we see the metrics. We know many of you are not subscribed. Give us a subscription over there on Broadway Sports Media's YouTube page and then find this live stream. We would love to interact with you in the comment section we'll be able to see them on our end and we'd love to hear your thoughts on the titans chargers matchup coming up all right let's talk titans chargers some some stats i want to get out there first before we dive into some particular matchups jt mike vrabel and that we're going to be a, a broken record on this all season long i i, I think every single for good reason yeah, and for yeah for good reason but every single thursday show we do we're going to mention mike vrabel's stats both from a betting perspective but also just as a coach we know that Mike Vrabel is one of the best in the league, and he is eight and four against the spread and straight up, which isn't something you see very often. But he is eight and four as a home dog. So as a home dog, he's been uh, uh, th his opponent has been favored twelve times in in his coaching career when they are at Nissan Stadium, and he has won twice as often as he has lost. Not only covering in those games, but winning outright. We've got some statistics about particular players in this game. Derrick Henry last week, a very quiet 100 yards from scrimmage for him because it was a pretty even split rushing and receiving. He breaks off in particular that, that really long screen pass run and is able to get over 50 yards on the ground and through the air. And his 100 plus yard uh, scrimmage from scrimmage yard performance last week in New Orleans, put him atop the current rankings um, from 2022 to 2023. So in the last season plus now, he is the uh, most decorated player in the league in terms of 100 plus yard scrimmage games, 13 such games since the beginning of 2022. Next closest, Nick Chubb with 12 and Christian McCaffrey with 12, Justin Jefferson with 11, the usual suspects. But I mean, we, we find a million different ways to say the same thing on Derrick Henry. It feels like every single week, he, he's the most impactful player on this team and one of the most impactful, productive players in the league. And this is just another way to demonstrate that. Which to me is a big surprise because I feel like the, the, the talk all week is, are we going to get Derrick Henry more involved? And I feel he like didn't that, play enough. He did and not yet play he had enough. 100, um, 100 yards and change. Right. And I think that that's an interesting uh, point to to say when you guys went when you're going to the to the uh practice fields and you're you you're go. interviewing these guys right and it's just like are, are we asking this question correctly like <laughs> this feels like a He's weird question to ask. our questions yeah. like did i not have a third of the yards in that game I'm exactly sure yeah. i had a third of the yards <laughs> in that game um another statistic and this is about a player that we're not sure is going to play this week we'll get to that some more in the news when we talk injury report deandre hopkins in New Orleans, um, had a over seven receptions in that game. I think he had seven on the nose, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Se yeah, seven receptions in that game, which puts him atop the list of current players in the league with seven-plus reception games all time, 58 such times in his career he's caught seven balls. JT, in, in uh, a tangential statistic to this, I, I was digging around today. Do you know how many games DeAndre Hopkins has started in his NFL career in which he did not have at least one catch? I mean, maybe like three or four, like maybe none of them. Really? Never. I was going to say never like, started in his game. like rookie years. I know. Like that. Isn't that astonishing? Yeah, never once in his career has he had a game where he didn't have at least one catch. Um, also in this matchup, Keenan Allen on that list of seven plus reception games 
among active players. He is tied for fourth with Stephon Diggs. They each have 50 games with seven or more receptions. So a couple of big name receivers, one of which we aren't certain we'll see this week. I wouldn't write it off yet, but we'll talk about more about that later. Um, by the way, DeAndre Hopkins is also 12th all time. Not only is he first in current players with seven plus reception yard games or seven plus reception games, uh, he is 12th all time in that in that metric and climbing. Let's talk matchups now. And I, something that I, I wanted to mention at the top of the show, we kind of started to get into it. I held it off because I wanted to mention it here. This game is going to look and feel so much different from week one fundamentally because Titans Saints is a matchup of two relatively similar teams, I would argue, in the sense that, and we don't really, we don't have a super firm identity on either of these teams because they are, have undergone so much change this offseason. They are two teams that I think it's fair to assume are going to rely on their defense a good bit throughout the season. They have competent offenses with quarterbacks that raise some questions, um, but but ultimately they're going to be able to score. They they just need their defense to hold the other team to probably sub 21 point, you know, three touchdowns or fewer in order to win games because while their offenses can score, they're not going to be um, like the, the dolphins breaking off 10 million explosive plays and, and scoring 35, 40 points a game. That's just not the way that they're built this week. The Titans face the chargers. And while the Titans obviously are a, a team that relies heavily on their defense and wants to be efficient on offense and, and possess the ball and run the ball and, and, play their game the chargers are are kind of the opposite and in that way this is a strength on strength weakness on weakness game i think because this chargers team on defense last week and, and the i would argue the la at least the last eight games of 2022 this brandon staley defense has been really really questionable whereas their offense you know you have justin herbert you have one of the best players in the one of the best quarterbacks in the league You've got now a trio of receivers that you have a lot of trust in. You've got some. You got a very talented running back. You've got a, some talented tight ends. They they you know they scored thirty plus points last week in that game against Miami. They're capable of doing that each and every week with that that cast of characters. And so in that way, you've got the Titans' strength on defense going up against the Chargers' offensive strength and the Titans' offensive weakness going up against the Chargers' defensive weakness. And so. Something that stuck out to me that I listened to, I listened to, to Greg Cosell with NFL Films talking, I forget where earlier this week, um, but I saw a clip of him somewhere online talking about um, week one, reacting some games, and he said that a former coach that he was speaking with this week was talking about how he thinks smart players and coaches in particular really would prefer ultimately to face challenging teams early on in the season because it exposes your weaknesses and it forces you to address those and make adjustments in the period of the season. Like we talk about September and October, the best coaches, your Andy Reeds, your Bill Belichick's, your, your Mike Tomlin's, they are historically doing their tinkering. They're changing a lot from week to week. They don't necessarily have a super firm identity on either side of the ball. They're seeing what they can and can't do and trying to address those weaknesses, fortify their team as best they can. So that then in November, December, and into January, you, you, you've been tested, right? You, you, you are a team that knows how to face multiple different looks and knows where maybe, you know, you know where your bread is buttered and, and but maybe more importantly, you know where it's not and where you can be exposed and you're able to preeminently um, proactively address those things in, in certain matchups. And so I think that this is going to be one of those games that is good for the Titans because it is strength on strength, weakness on weakness. It's going to force them, I think, to have it's it's a litmus test for sure, right? Because I think we know what this Chargers offense is. I'm not sure we know what the defense is as much, but if this Chargers offense is stymied by the Titans defense in the way that it was last December, I mean, what was it, week 14, 15. 15, week 15, they faced them last year. They held them to 17 points. The Titans defense did. They were, I mean, they're, they're top their top uh, players on defense in the secondary in that game were Kevin Byard and Roger McCreary and a bunch of deck chairs and lawn furniture. So they certainly have better personnel on the back end defensively this time around. Um, up front, you've got a, a much healthier Danico Autry and, and Jeffrey Simmons available to you. Both of them were, you know, ailing down the stretch. And then this Titans offense, I think they, did they lose that game 17 to 14? I think, I think they lost by a field goal. 
The Titans offense was able to score a couple of times in that game. It was it was a close loss. That was one of those games where Ryan Tannehill in the first half, that ankle gets tweaked again. He leaves. I think Malik Willis hands the ball off three or four times. And then Tannehill comes back out with a whole roll and a half of tape on his ankle and just hobbles through that game. And and um, that was one of those close ones that they, one of the seven that they lost at the end of the year, many of which were very close. So that being said, um, some specific matchups in this game that I want to talk to you about um, that I consider strengths for them. This is another thing that we might be a broken record on week in and week out, but I think that this is a coaching mismatch again. Mike Vrabel, we know what he is. He's a known commodity as a coach. He's one of the best coaches in the league. Brandon Staley is a guy that I, he, he single-handedly has forced me, as long as he has been with the Chargers, to doubt the Chargers coming into each season because I just think he is a limiting factor as their head coach. I think that he's not very good. I don't think he's very good at his job. I mean, yeah, you kind of go back to last season and you know that there are glaring f- flaws with him and you can always just point to that playoff game where he he's the defense he, guy he is the defense guy and their defense let them down let the jacksonville jaguars kind of win that game and beat his own defense so it, it's going to be a challenge for him and I, I agree with you i think mike vrabel has the upper hand here um because of just how he's able to kind of control both sides of the ball no i agree um, not, not a ton to dive into on, on that matchup. Again, I just, I think it, a coaching mismatch, especially when the, the better coach is at home, I think is something that you, you cannot overlook in any game in the NFL, a, a player matchup that I think is not necessarily flying under the radar this week. I heard our buddies over on the music city audible, um, Justin, and Justin talking about this mm-hmm. on their preview show, the Titans. And, and again, Deandre Hopkins is a big question mark for this game. So, yes. so if he's not in this game, that's, seven catches and what 12 targets last week. That's that's a, a, about 10 targets. I'd imagine that are up for grabs if he's not playing in this game. So that just amplifies this point. The guys that can expose the middle of the field against this chargers defense are going to have the potential to really eat in this game. And the two that I highlighted are Chica Conquo and Ty J Spears, who, who is at this point, I was kind of a concern earlier in the week injury wise practiced in full today spoiler i think that he's going to be another big impact in this game Um, whether or not he plays more than derrick henry we'll see i i I doubt that happens based on how much blowback there has been but even if he's not it may it may go 60 40 flipped to 40 60 you're still going to get a lot of ty j spears they're not sitting him down they're really fond of him and what he can do and especially as a a threat in the past game because we saw in that first game not only are they comfortable with him on the field they're comfortable with him as a running back running routes out of the backfield and lined up in the slot. They, they are comfortable with him as a route runner. He's going to be one of those guys that's going to be able to expose the, those seam routes, those middle of the field crossing routes and the player on the chargers defense in particular that, that I think that they're going to be able to pick on is, is Kenneth Murray, who is a, I think this is his, he's a third year, either second or third year linebacker um, had some questions coming out that I think are all coming to bear at this point not the biggest guy in the world. His coverage skills are really lacking. He was the lowest graded, according to PFF, defender on the Chargers team last week in week one with a 29.4 PFF score, which if you're not familiar with PFF is about as bad as you see for any player. I I think Kadarius Tony had a 22 in week one for reference. So there's your reference. Um, Just barely better than what Kadarius did, according to PFF. He allowed four receptions on five targets for nearly 60 yards in week one against a Dolphins team that has a lot of talent in the receiving core. But I, I mean, in terms of their, in terms of their, their guys, they're going to punish you across the middle of the field. And that's not really what Jalen Waddle and, and Tyreek, I mean, Tyreek can punish you anywhere, but those guys are the speedsters. They're lined up on the outside more often than not. And they're, they're trying to stretch the field more often than not. And the Titans in, in guys like Spears and in Chig are, are, and and Traylon is a big slot used the way that you saw AJ Brown used a bunch in his heyday here in Tennessee, the way that he'd have those crossing routes where it would be a seven yard, seven air yard catch that goes for 93 yards and a touchdown. That's something that I'd kind of be shocked to see them not try to exploit this week. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you there. And I still think that the wide receivers that they have this week, if it is just in fact, Traylon Burks and Nick Westbrook, Akine and Chris Moore is like your one, two, three punch. Right. I still do think you try to get Traylon Burks and Nick Westbrook, Akine um, 
those kind of looks that we kind of saw Tyreek kind of get as he got downfield and then you kind of open the space because of how much you can take away that linebacking core and just right. kind of get those more one-on-one matchups. I, I'm super excited to see that, but I do agree with you that like if there is a week t- for Tim Kelly to to kind of use his dynamic weapons in Chigakonkwo and Ty J Spears, like this is the week to do it. I, 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 while we're on receivers, this is kind of out of the, the structure of the show, but I just wanted to mention, and I, I wanted to try to get our audience involved here. If you're watching with us live on YouTube, in the comments, let us know who, who's the receiver. And I'm, I'm posing this question to you as well. Who's the receiver on this Chargers team that you are most concerned about against this Titans team? I mean, it's got to be Mike Williams to me personally. Um, I think that was the biggest. I, I, I think that was the biggest uh, concern last season when they played against this yeah, this Titans team, um, and I think it continues to be because there wasn't that much turnover in the secondary. There is a clear and obvious height differential, kind of when you're going up against Mike Williams and this team, especially if your name is, is uh, uh, Roger McCreary. Roger McCreary, yes. right? Um, Height like, and reach differential that is. However, they were a losing kind, of, they kind of were able to lock him down last season, but like, I, I still just think that with however many weapons they have, and if, if I'm not mistaken, that he was really banged up at the end of last year. He too. was. I, yes, I'm imagining he probably um, wasn't at full strength and, in that game. You know, he still is dealing with a few injuries now, as Mike Williams does. Um, but like, he just is that dynamic guy that can beat you on the outside like that. Right. And he's going to win those contested catches nine out of 10 times. And I think that's where he has the clear and obvious edge against the Titans secondary. Well, and he's the kind of guy that not only can he do that, but against this secondary in particular, we've been pretty critical of the way that they played in week one. If they play that level to that level that they did in week one and week two, I think that they're going to get beat and they're going to allow a couple of shot plays. Shane Bowen, the Titans defensive coordinator this week was vocally not happy today when he spoke to the media about the fact that, I, and I forget the exact numbers, but the, the Titans allowed something like 160 yards on four or five X plays against that Saints team. On a, on a, on a whole, they did, they, they did a decent job as a defense. Um, I think that they, they did above league average as a defense. Um, obviously, the, the front was fantastic, and the secondary was, was bad, but not, not bad enough to cancel out how great the front was in getting pressure. But they were allowing explosive plays simply too often, the kind of back-breaking plays that, frankly, this Titans defense has grown accustomed to allowing the way that they've built their identity on being bendable between the 20s so that you don't break in the red zone. And that's a frustrating way to watch football as a, as a fan. It's very nerve-wracking to see a team cut like a hot knife through butter 20 to 20 and then kick a field goal because they run into a brick wall. At the, at the end of the day, you take a deep breath, but every drive feels like a nightmare and like the dam is about to burst. This Chargers team can absolutely put up those X plays against you. Justin Herbert, pinpoint accuracy, throws a gorgeous deep ball. Again, one of the he has the athleticism absolutely to extend plays and give his receivers time to get down the field. If you're looking, if you're a betting man looking to to place a Chargers longest reception wager, I don't know what the number is. I've not looked at it. But if it's something like 24 and a half yards or 27 yard, like it would, I'd be kind of surprised if there wasn't at least one big 30 yard shot play that connects between Justin Herbert and one of his receivers. And Mike Williams is absolutely one of those guys looking at last year's box score. It was Keenan Allen that went off the most. And I, I really chalked that up more to being a result of how little secondary personnel the Titans had. I mean, you, you had some lawn chairs and deck furniture out there guarding the likes of Keenan Allen who can and will slice and dice you uh as a as a slot a big slot and and as a guy across the middle of the field um he had eight receptions that game for almost 90 yards mike williams four receptions for 67 yards like there it is 16.8 yards per per, um completion a long of 35 some other guys that went off in that game josh palmer uh former volunteer for life he he had a nice game gerald everett is a guy you'll see in this game Donald Parham is somebody that uh, he tore his ACL at the end of last year, I believe. So he won't be available for this game. Um, but, but one name that is on this, this box score and was one of the biggest impacts for them was Austin Eckler. And I'll be pretty shocked if we see him in this game. I think that him not too. being yeah. available for them. I don't want to get ahead of our, of our show here and talk too much about, about the injury impact, but I, I, I didn't, 
expect him to be a massive problem for them in the running game because I don't expect anybody to be a massive problem for them in the running game because of how good this run defense is. But as a scab back, as a guy coming out of the backfield, as a guy that can catch and run, he's kind of a nightmare to have to deal with. So to be able to cross him off your list of potential you know, nightmare receiving threats is is got to be a nice feeling for the Titans. I would I would agree. So I think now I will say that they do have a back in Joshua Kelly who is coming off his very efficient career, career best, best game. Um, game, who is a better just physical runner than Austin Eckler right. is. However, but we don't like, think that really matters against this Titans it, team. It might not matter. When was the last time the Titans had faced a, a, a runner where it really mattered? I mean, like obviously Saquon torched them week one last year. Samanje P. Ryan did P. Ryan. Do, did do some damage against them in this that Cincinnati right. Bengals game. But besides that, like I think was Jeffrey Simmons playing in that game? I don't remember. I, if he was, he was hurt. That was around that period when you, you were missing a lot of those interior guys. But that is true. That the, the point stands is very few instances come to mind in the past year plus where you, you had a, a rushing concern. Let's uh let's keep chugging through these notes here. A matchup of weakness that I wanted to talk about was actually oh I'm giving the upper hand to the Chargers offense against offensive line that is against this Titans defensive front. If we saw what we saw last week with Harold Landry on one side, staying on that one side, um, staying on that um, from from the you know on, on the the offensive line's right side, yes, um, the left side from the defensive perspective, and Arden Key staying on the offense's left hand side. You've got a very different tackle combination here in, in uh, what Arden Key's going to face. He's not facing Trevor Penning again. He had a fantastic True. debut, yes. fantastic debut for Arden Key. However, going from Trevor Penning to Rashawn Slater, slight step up that I want to talk about in a, mat a pivotal matchup here in a second. But on the other side, that's where I really think the weakness is based on what we saw from Harold Landry in week one. Now, the caveat here is Danico Autry is known for bouncing outside and, and helping out as an end often in games. And he was unblockable wherever he lined up last week. So I don't think that this would be a net negative for the Titans, a matchup of Danico Autry against right tackle Trey Pipkins for the Chargers. But if it's Landry and Pipkins all day long, uh, Pipkins is, is no world beater as a tackle. But but as a whole, Pipkins on on uh, on Landry and Slater on key is a, a pretty you, you feel comfortable about that as a Chargers fan. The Titans, I think, need to consider flipping those two things. If you put their current strength off the edge, the hot hand in Arden Key against Pipkins, you may have another two sack day from him. You may have another big impact day from him. With Landry, I just don't think he has the, the juice yet. He's nursing that abdominal injury that he had going into week one. Then, of course, coming back off of the, the ACL, I just I didn't see anything on uh, in, in the game or on tape from him in week one that made me say, yeah, he can be a multiple sack in a game, you know, seven, eight, nine pressures in a game impact the way that we're accustomed to seeing Harold Landry at full strength. That's not to say that he's not that guy anymore. That's, that's to say that right now he's not. So I think that that's something that they, they need to consider flipping. Yeah, I would agree. It, it'll be interesting because it, this Titans defense is very stubborn, I think. And like you, it, we've been talking about versatility a lot on the offensive side of the ball, but the defense feels very like cut and dry, just like this is this is what we're going to do. Right. So it'll be interesting to see if it if they start out like they they have been, and um, Arden Key is not getting a lot of success against Slater. Do they make that change? And that'll be interesting to see this right. weekend. I saw a couple of guys in the comments here. Z Dean saying he feels a little better this year with Sean Murphy bunting and Christian Fulton. Last year, we had Greg Mabin who gave up 110 yards on nine targets this against the true. Chargers. Titans legend, Greg Mabin. He said we also had uh, Andrew Adams, Titans legend. John Reed was also a part of that secondary. Um, let's talk a little bit about key and Slater that is assuming they don't switch a key matchup in this game and it is I mean like Rashawn Slater is a young man that can ball he's one of the best tackles in the league one of the best left tackles in the a league big reason why for they sure. struggled on offense last season. right they lose they lose him in week him. two yep. week three he goes down mm -hmm. for the year um he's back and looked good in week one he's a stud but Arden Key I think is also a stud and I I, I don't think it's crazy to say we may be in the midst of a like a mid to late career ascendancy. I, I say it's not late in Arden Key's career, but it's it's late to make the leap. And I think he may be just a, a late bloomer in that regard because 
from what we saw through camp, what we saw in week one, the, the trend from what he looked like in San Francisco to Jacksonville to Tennessee, it all points to this guy not reaching a ceiling yet. He continues to get better and better, and he's still young, and he's still learning, and I, I kind of think that he's finding his game-breaking ceiling now as a Titan at the perfect time for Tennessee. I would agree with that. I think, like you said, and it's not late, but obviously being on your third team overall is probably a little late. Um, but right. of course, that's why they brought him in. I think that was, it was, if I'm not mistaken, like one of the first guys that Rand Carthen brought in. Yep. If it was not the first or second guy that it he brought in. It was that first batch of guys the, that he He was he very wanted. early on. And from even then, we knew that like, oh, this guy might have the juice to even make this front seven even better some numbers on him from week one most quarterback pressures in a game since the beginning of the 2022 season according to next gen stats so in week one he came in second in the league tied with uh, the bills at oliver and seattle's uh uchenna nuosu with 11 quarterback pressures according to uh next gen stats first overall was nick bosa Oh, excuse me. Oh, I said since week one. I totally read this wrong. This is most in any game since the beginning of last season, week one. So an even more impressive metric. Second, um, his week one performance comes to Nick Bosa, who uh, against the Rams last October had 12. He had one of the best games of the last two years in terms of pressuring the quarterback in week one. Another metric, most quarterback pressures in a game by a Titans player since the beginning of the 2019 let's see. Nine, it's very small. 2019 season, according to Next Gen Stats, he comes in second, um, just behind Harold Landry, who had that massive career year in his contract year, and, and that's what got him paid. Uh, again, 11 pressures for him. Um, the, the second most by a Titans player, Harold Landry, had a, a 12 pressure game against the Colts in September of 2021. So certainly a guy to watch in this game. Certainly a guy that I think will probably start up against that left side. I. The Titans aren't really a team known for switching their guys side to side a lot on the defense, whether it's in the secondary or up front. They do make some exceptions. I kind of think by halftime in this game, they'll be considering making that exception, if not having already made it. So that's something to watch. Um, another pivotal matchup is Kellen Moore, the, the Chargers' new offensive coordinator, uh, formerly with Dallas for the past couple of seasons. He replaces Joe Lombardi who was a abject disaster in uh, in L.A. The, the Football Hipster Society had been calling for his head for over a year. They were delighted to see him go because many that are firm believers in Justin Herbert were like, this Joe Lombardi cat's got to go. Like, he's holding, he's holding our boy back. And so now you get Kellen Moore in there, younger, I, I would say, universally agreed upon as a better offensive mind. And in his his scheme is going up against that of Shane Bowen, Titans defensive coordinator. Um Looking at what Kellen Moore did in week one, because this is another game where the Titans are facing off against a team that personnel wise on offense, pretty similar. They don't have a quarterback change like the Saints did, but in terms of their scheme, it's a brand new coordinator. We, we don't know yet quite what Moore is going to do to marry his track record in the NFL with what he has in his personnel in LA. But in week one against the Dolphins, and I want to put a caveat on all of this, talking about last week and saying, the Dolphins and the Titans are very different opponents. These coordinators don't have one game plan that they copy and paste game to game. It may look completely different. So we're going we're gonna to take that grain of salt and try to find some clues from last week without assuming this is what it's going to look like against the Titans. It could be the complete opposite because in some ways the Titans and Dolphins are complete opposites. But in week one, very, very low air yards per target in his scheme. And that was something that people were mad about Joe Lombardi having a, a Ferrari and Justin Herbert, is in particular, his arm and his ability to take deep shots, stretch the field, break your defense with those X plays, and he just refused to do it. He refused to push the ball down the field. Lombardi did with his scheme. Kellen Moore comes in. Dak Prescott is a guy that they've not been afraid to do that in Dallas with C.D. Lamb taking shots. So they thought many that were they're a fan of this move, that Kellen Moore would come in and be a guy that's going to immediately stretch the field. We're going to see just we're going to see just what this guy what this guy can do pushing the ball down the field and, and stretching things and offensively in week one his air yards per target were very i think it was like seven around the ballpark of seven if, I, if i'm not mistaken air yards per target um from from kellen and herbert uh which is below both of their standards below even what lombardi was doing on average with herbert that's not to say that it won't change in this game and based on the way that this is tight and secondary had a proclivity in week one to give up some big plays 
maybe that number triples. <laughs> Zayer yards per target is like 19. But I, I was surprised by how little they pushed the ball downfield in that first game. However, despite that, Kellen Moore's offensive performance in week one, sneaky good, even though they lost the game. I think obviously that you score 30 points. It's easy to say it's probably the defense had a, a, a big hand in that loss. He had the number one offensive success rate, um, according to the metric offensive success rate, in the league in that week one game. One out of 32, according to uh, to that metric, Kellen Moore's offensive success was. Um, Shane Bowen, like I mentioned earlier, just reading through my notes here, he was displeased in the amount of chunk plays the Titans allowed. Again, like 160 yards on five completions, something they absolutely cannot do against this Chargers team. Um, a, a metric from the Chargers' first game that was fascinating to me and, and a big talk of this game that I, I've kind of buried the lead a little bit because it was the most impressive part of what the Chargers did offensively. But I, I buried it intentionally because I don't think it's what we'll see against this Titans team. JT, they had, according to efficiency metrics, one of the, this is not an exaggeration, one of the best rushing performances in a single game as a team of all time in the history of the NFL. They did. Yep. They were top 10 um, in terms of rushing game performances uh, efficiency wise in that game had over 200 yards. This is a, a really funny way of framing their week one loss because of that top 10 list of rushing, rushing efficiency games all time. They were the only team on that list to have lost that game where they went off running the ball. Typically when you have an amazing rushing performance, you're salting the, the game away against an inferior opponent. But another one that's just, if you're a Chargers fan, you you have to have been talking about this all week long. This is kind of a niche stat, but it's a massive sample size. So teams that ran the ball 200 or more yards in a game allowed less than 100 yards rushing against them, had zero turnovers themselves, and won the turnover battle by two or more. So one that over doubled your opponent rushing the ball, and you ran the ball for 200 plus yards. And then winning the turnover battle by two or more and being clean, not turning the ball over at all. Those teams since 2000 had been 110 and 0, and that, now they are 110 and 1 because that is exactly what the Chargers did in losing that game to the Dolphins. But um, before we move on to, to the next topic, any thoughts on on Kellen Moore and what what challenge he brings for this team? And I think the the air yards per target could be kind of chalked up to they wanted to do something out of Kellen Moore's like comfort zone in that they wanted to slow the game down as much as possible, even though they really couldn't have, but you, like you saw, you give the ball back to the dolphins every single time. Maybe just and, force and, trying to force that Mike McDaniels Ferrari of an offense to slow down and dictate pace. Exactly. Right. Um, and so I, ju I just think that what you saw last week is probably not exactly what you are going to see this week against the, the, the Titans. And it's like very hard to go off of, I think. The last matchup I want to talk about is the Titans offensive line versus Chargers defensive line. I saw a pretty good one. The, the, the weakest spot being that left tackle position. Um, but this Chargers defensive line in week one really underperformed. Um, they, uh, Nick Bosa and Khalil Mack, their top two guys uh, that you, you have circled when you're facing this team yes. up front. They had four and six pressures last week, respectively. All of them were QB hurries. So, they, they, you know, really a sneaky bad game for them in that respect. Uh, their defensive tackle, Sebastian Joseph Day, the only guy on that team with a quarterback hit last week. Tua stayed very clean. Now, I think a big part of that, every surprising stat like this typically has a corresponding stat to explain it away a little bit. Tua got the ball out last week at an alarming rate. He was getting the ball out so quickly. Sub two and a half seconds um, time to throw for him. Ryan Tannehill, on the contrary, in week one, had, uh, I think, right around, if not north of three seconds to throw per drop back. So, like, a four-tenths, five-tenths of a second added on to the time that the Chargers defensive line, on average, is going to have to get home, that's going to help. Like, that's not a, that's not an insignificant number at all. It's a pretty significant metric. Um, but I don't think that's all that it was. I, I just, I, personally, I don't think Khalil Mack is... I think he's kind of lost it a little bit. I think he's lost a step. Nick Bosa, I wouldn't say that about, but he didn't look good in week one. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I would agree with you on that one. Khalil, Khalil Mack is not what he once was, right? And then also we saw... How old is he? 
he's somebody you could tell me he's like 28 or you could tell me he's 32 and I'd believe you either way. I'm not sure. But then also, like you said, Joey Bosa also kind of dealing with an injury this week. He always is. It'll be interesting to see how effective he is this week. But like, it's going to be a problem for, for this team, especially when the Saints were getting after Ryan Tannehill this past week. And Ryan Tannehill sometimes was looking to rush kind of in his, in his progression, failing clean pockets. Now you have, now you have a guy in Joey Bosa, who is one of the top 10 pass rushers in the league. And then you have a guy in Khalil Mack who still can do it. Like it's going to be very interesting. Khalil Mack, by the way, is 32 years old. Okay. So I I had a feeling he was really old, but he was somebody that was like, maybe he's sneaky young. He's just been in the league forever. Um, yeah, no, I agree. All of that is to say, though, that offensive line versus defensive line matchup for the Titans, I think that you may be in, uh, you know, the efficiency metrics for them, or not the efficiency metrics, but the the advanced metrics for them, judging the offensive line in week one, kind of all came to a head at league average, which is yes. what we've been talking all season long, like all off season long, that is. If this defensive, if they can jump up 16 spots from 32 to 16, this offensive line is going to be serviceable and you won't be able to blame them for every yes. game. I certainly don't think you can blame week one on them. I think that they did more than enough to win that game. It was other, <laughs> which, is, which is why I'm just so concerned about like, we need to see Tannehill be more confident sure. here this week. I think above all else, like, because you are going to go up. You mean just him. simply like start step one, looking more comfortable in the pocket. Yes. Yeah. Because, because again, on, on tape, there were a number of times he looked uncomfortable but the pocket provided to him didn't like, you know, it was, it was a guy's fine. He was freaking out, but he had room to operate. Yeah. I don't know. Seeing ghosts, not it's clearly just not at ease in that pocket. Speaking of Ryan Tannehill, um, a, a Twitter follow that I'm going to shout out because it's one that I've been eyeballing for a, a couple of months now. And I finally gave him the follow today. I, I don't, I have no idea who this person is or what their affiliation to sports is besides they clearly know ball um, at Jake and ball. Very many, many thousands of followers on on Twitter um, is a big Titans fan, it seems. So, so Jake, if you're catching this, um, I think you're a good follow. Congratulations, you know ball, sir. You are a ball knower. He certified, cut, he certified ball knower. He, he ran down some of the the metrics from last season in week two. Ryan Tannehill's worst game was that week two performance where they got shellacked by Buffalo up in New York. The next week was a, a better performance for them against Las Vegas when they finally get their first win of the game. The difference in what he did game to game there, I think he he, he brings this up, Jake does, and is, is a, a, a wise way of looking at what we might can expect from Tannehill in this game to right his ship. Because again, we I'm going to go out on a limb and say he's already had his worst performance of the year. It's going to be hard to be worse than what he was in week one. So last season, just to try to try to gauge this, Ryan Tannehill in week one was uh, negative 11 completion percentage over expectation, CPOE, 8.7 air yards, and negative 0.54 EPA per play. In week three, he followed that performance up with plus 6.3 completion percentage over expected, a, you know, a, a seven, nearly 18 percentage point swing, a diminished air yard average of seven air yards in that game so 1.7 fewer yards on average per completion and then a negative 0.187 epa per play which dictates he was being much more conservative he wasn't actively he he had a good game but wasn't uh an x factor he wasn't the one he was he was very much a a trailer in that game and and not much of of a tractor trying to pull the team along with him um then you look at how he fared against the chargers last year and it was a relatively similar performance to what we saw in that Vegas game. It was a more reserved, and, and again, he was hurt in that game. So I think maybe that was by necessity a little bit, but it was more reserved. It was taking the singles, not forcing the doubles and the triples and looking for the home runs as much. And so Jake's, he posits, and I think it, this is something that is absolutely fair. You may just, we may see a much less aggressive game from Tannehill, less deep shots, more singles, check downs, stuff that is safer and more patient, not necessarily a bad way to play ball. Again, you, that, that allows you if you're successful in that way to chip and chip away and, and death by a thousand cuts, um, take a team to the woodshed very slowly and just ball, you know, time of possession. It dictates you win that game because you, you force the other team to wait on you all day long. The Titans have been good at that in the past. Um, and so he predicts a game like that 
my counterpoint, and I, I don't, I don't actually think that this is going to be the case, but if, if you were to say, actually, that's not what happens, actually, it's the same, or maybe he's even more aggressive. This Chargers team defensively last week against a much better offense in Miami, granted, but, but they, they, they allowed 20 explosive plays in that game, which was eight clear of the next most Cincinnati allowed 12 for reference, Tennessee allowed nine, one rushing and eight passing with the chargers. Their 20 plays were broken up as three explosive rushes and 17 explosive passing plays. So the, the Titans may just look at this defense and say, yeah, maybe we want Ryan Tannehill in these situations to play more conservative, but in this instance in particular, we're we're still going to feel obligated to take some shots and try to break this defense because they're breakable. Clearly, they're breakable. And, and the, this take is probably not a good one because it's so boring and really doesn't amount to anything. But mm -hmm. like, I cannot say for certain which way they'll go with that because <laughs> in, in, in you're right that in, take does have no substance. That's here, not a take. Here's here's why. <laughs> right. I think you look at that metric of the Chargers not giving up that much rushing because of just how little the Miami Dolphins were doing already. Right. Um, Raheem the dream. And kind of already putting more eff emphasis on to Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle already. Like they were, they were already trying to put emphasis on stopping their best parts of their team and still kind of were bad at that. So what if they do the same this week? And we know that this Chargers run defense, which was 29th in the league last year, mm -hmm. What if they try to put emphasis once again on Henry and he just has the explosive plays because it, it, the personnel there just isn't enough, I think, to right. stop these explosive plays sometimes. So it'll be very interesting to see, like, because I do think we will see a lot more Derrick Henry this week, but maybe not in more carries to Derrick Henry because I think outside of what we saw last week, Derrick Henry might be on the field to just use that as like a scare tactic, a fear sure. tactic that Derrick Henry can forcing you to break account off for him. at right. any single moment. So, uh, unlike you, who your take is just I don't know, <laughs> lame, weak. My bad. I'm Sorry. going. I'm going to posit what I think. Now, this is. I'm not predicting what they will do. This is what I think that they should do. Got I think that they ultimately shouldn't really materially change their game plan much offensively. Um, from week one to week two. I think that they should do a lot of the same. Playing more conservatively will keep you from making as many massive backbreaking mistakes like Tannehill did, but there's a little bit of a play scared and lose like, you know, mentality there of like, you know, you got, you, you've got this team, you've been game planning how you generally want it to look all summer long. You've been practicing that way for over a month now. You've got a new offensive coordinator that, you know, I think week one was a, Un, unfiltered look into the way that he generally wants this team to play football. And that is taking shots, being creative, trying to push the ball downfield and also cap be capable of being a ground and pound team that, that is efficient and, and kills you on the ground. Um, I, I just, I don't think that they should fall prey to overreacting to week one and going away from a game plan that, that ultimately worked. And that's, that's my, my main reason for them going with it. Again, if you just mentally take out the three interceptions from Ryan Tannehill, which were bad reads and or bad throws, and you consider if you just take Tannehill out of the equation and consider the rest of what went on offensively, how, how the players were able to get open on the, on the tape, the creativity of the play calls, the play of the offensive line, it worked. It, it, it worked. Yep. If you, if you just plug in a, a, a a quarterback that that throws one less interception and connects on one of those t touchdowns, they win the game pretty comfortably. Um, and so that's the ultimate reason why I think that they shouldn't get scared by that game that was good and ruined by Ryan Tannehill's day and, and try to re rewrite the way that they're going to approach the game offensively. I think it'd be foolish. I, I, I agree with you. I think, obviously, when we get to the news here and start to talk about some injuries, this is where you kind of have to deviate from that offensive game plan, but then also and not to, not to beat you to the punch here, just something I want to add yeah. about this game. At, like we saw last year with their chargers game. I, I see that you hear the secondary has to be maybe the biggest, like it, it, defensively, the it's the only change that you want, right? I think it's the only fair to like defensively. What do you want to change be, in this game? How about the secondary just doesn't stink? How about that? And I think the game might be more on the secondary than it is on Tannehill this week. And what I mean by that is mm. that when we looked at the, 
the Titans and Chargers game last season, Justin Herbert had a bad day, but I mean, the Titans made some crazy plays. I mean, we, we kind of forget about that. I think it was the Trey Avery one where it was like the push out of like the, they're in the end zone. The, he, in the end zone. He jumps, and he, bats the ball back in bounds for the interception. Like it, it took some right crazy yeah. athletic plays it to did. stay in this game. Sure. And so if they can just play more consistently, I think it's going to make all the difference than if Ryan Tannehill comes back to normal Ryan Tannehill. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. So before we get to the news, that, that's my ultimate final word is they shouldn't change their game plan. Offensively, the changes they should make some more of Henry early and often and and ultimately being more willing to go to him if the passing game is not going the way you want it. I was less upset with the amount of Derrick Henry usage in a vacuum in that game and more upset by the fact that when things weren't going right with the passing game and with Ryan Tannehill in particular, you didn't then lean on your guy Derrick Henry. Like there were multiple drives in the second half of that game where you're like, this feels like a Derrick Henry drive. And it wasn't. Hey, this feels like if there was ever a time for a no, okay. That, that's something that they need to be able to adjust and be like, okay, let's 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 go to plan B. Derrick Henry's a great plan B if that's going to be the case. So be willing to do that. And then defensively, the secondary just has to play it better. All right, that's our preview of Titans Chargers. Um, these are just going to get easier, JT. I, I, I'm I'm I, I'm not trying to rush the season along, but these previews get so much easier when we have a sample size of more than one game to look at these teams, evaluate these opponents. Um, there's a lot more to say. So sorry if we were rambling a lot in, in that rundown. Um, I think I think that ultimately we got some good points in there, but um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to having – it's just the first month, you don't quite know what all these teams are yet, and that's the beauty of it, trying to figure it out, crack the case, solve the puzzle. But for now, I think that this this game, like, like we say, week one is a liar. These two teams may, in this Sunday's performance, look completely different than the two teams we saw in week one. It would not shock me at all if Ryan Tannehill comes back, has two touchdowns, zero interceptions. The Titans offense works well. They have a couple of big plays from big contributors, and they score twenty, like 24 points, 27 points. That would not shock me simply because of, aside from Ryan Tannehill, how much that offense truly worked when you watched it on tape. Um, it also wouldn't shock me if they continue to have issues. Like I just, I, I'm, I'm an open book mentally on what this team is. Um, and with that, let's get to some news for the week before we get to the best bet gauntlet. This is the news with producer JT. Yeah, and we can start here with the Tennessee Titans injury report for today, Thursday, September 14th. Let's start with the guys who who practice fully. We're going to start with Trey Avery and Dylan Radis, Radins, who have now logged two straight full participation yep, days. Good for them to be back here. And then some also other good news here. Traylon Burks and Ty J Spears, both back to full participation uh, this week. Your thoughts on those guys? It's a big deal. Um, I, with, with Spears, it was more of a concern. You know, that groin didn't seem to hamper him at all in Sunday's game. But you know, he then pops up on a Wednesday. Wednesdays are the, are the biggest, maybe something, maybe nothing situation in terms of injury reports. Um, and so him being back is a big, big deal. Traylon being back, uh, obviously we knew he would be with with the, the the fact that he was just dealing with a personal injury issue yesterday, not an injury. Good for them to be back, and the Titans are going to need those two guys in this game, especially if DeAndre Hopkins is not out there. Yeah, then we can move on to two guys who continue to be limited in their participation at practice this week, Christian Fulton and Tier Tart. Christian Fulton obviously dealing with that hamstring injury, and then Tier Tart with a groin-slash-knee injury. Your thoughts on these guys and if they'll be able to go this week? Yeah, Tart is a he's a tough one. I I, I would be kind of surprised if he didn't go. Um, they add that knee; it's a little bit concerning for sure. He now has a groin and a knee, so maybe they uh, don't force him back into this game. He, he's a big. He's the one of two guys that are the biggest to watch out for on the Friday injury report, which I think will be the most telling. Yeah, and then finally. We have the bad news. Oh, I forgot. I totally forgot Christian Fulton. Yeah, Christian Fulton. Christian Fulton. Sorry. Uh, Also a very big deal. So three guys that are that are very important to watch for on Friday. Um, Fulton in the locker room yesterday. The vibe that I got is that he's going to be okay. He's going to be fine. Maybe if I'll tell you this, if they don't play him in this game, because he has practiced in limited fashion the past two days. If they don't play him, I think it's going to be more preventative than anything. And if that's the case, it's obviously a big deal against a good receiving core in LA. But um, I would, I'd be, I, I would, I would say it's more, and this is just a guess on my part, educated guess. It's more likely than not he plays, but Friday's report for him will be the most telling 
he'll probably be deemed questionable tomorrow and it'll be a game time decision. Yeah, and then finally, the bad news this week. Amani Hooker still not practicing with that concussion. Not and, shocking. And then DeAndre Hopkins, who popped up this week with an ankle injury, did not practice on Wednesday and Thursday. Easton, obviously, it's looking more and more like Amani Hooker is probably not going to go for this game as he still is in concussion protocol. Not too surprising, as we've seen over the past year or two, how much they emphasize. That's the way the Titans do it. Um, if, you're on, if, you get, if you're in the protocol on one game, you're missing at least one game. That's pretty much how it works. So, look for him not to be out there, which is a bummer because there was also another stat just saying how good of a duo Amani Hooker and Christian Fulton were last week against the Saints. Yes. So that'll be a bummer. And then DeAndre Hopkins, the big scare this week, dealing with an ankle injury, still uh, did not practice Wednesday or Thursday. Also, I believe wasn't seen today as well. Yeah, not practicing the past two days. If, if you're wondering when did he injure his ankle, he played the whole game. He did. He injured it on the very last offensive play for Great. scrimmage because, yeah. of course, um, that the video of that from the broadcast is on my Twitter account, by the way, at Easton Freeze. You can go and find that if you're curious. Just got rolled up awkward by uh, linebacker Demario Davis. You can see him run off the field. Um, you can't, based on the camera angle, you can't tell whether he's hobbling or not, but he is running off the field. And then they cut to him on the sideline, laying down with his feet up in the air, kind of working that ankle out to see what's what's up and what's wrong. Um, it could be the case that he sprained it and he misses a week or two. Could be the case that he just gently tweaked it and is resting. Um, he's one of the tougher players in the league. When he's able to go, historically, he goes. Um, so I'd say, like, Friday is the big... It's a big tell for him. I, I think he'll either be deemed questionable or out tomorrow. My guess is he'll probably be questionable and be another game-time decision, but at this point, it would not shock me if he misses at least one week to get that ankle back. Again, it's September. They're going to want him down the stretch and not want to force an injury that's the kind of injury if you force it back it can it can linger all season long yeah we can move to the los angeles chargers side of the ball here obviously starting with austin eckler who such a weird situation going on here we heard that he does in fact have a high ankle sprain right um but also just the the chargers brass being kind of quiet about this injury no obviously IR, yesterday no, yeah. yesterday not practicing having that ankle de designation, but also gone for a personal issue. And then people were wondering if that was the case. Now I saw he you hopped not, on a podcast at one point this week. I, I don't and know. obviously he did not practice on Thursday. So it'll be interesting to watch him this week. I'll be shocked if he goes. I don't, I, I don't, I, would I don't too. think he's playing in this game. I would too. I think obviously with the chargers, I think the biggest thing is the chargers have a week five bye, So it'll be interesting, right. not just this week, but going forward to see if Austin Eckler plays and if they kind of just shut him down for right now. For what it's worth, further proof, earlier this week, the Chargers did sign a practice squad running back. Yes, they did. So that that's the type of thing that typically indicates you, you're going to need some extra running back help. And then, of course, there's other guys on this list like Eric Kendricks, who did not practice, but also for personal reasons. Diane Henley, a guy, a rookie this year for the Chargers, who inside came back yep. uh, limited, who will help them on the inside there. Some notable guys, but then the biggest guy here, Joey Bosa, who has not practiced all week this week with a hamstring injury. I don't know about you, but my sense here is this is very much like a Jeffrey Simmons kind of thing. Not practicing, not practicing I'll be practices. If, yeah, yeah. I'll be surprised if he doesn't play. He may not even practice at all. It may just be rest all week long and he and he still plays. I'll be kind of surprised at this point if he's not playing. So that is the injury report for both the Titans and the Los Angeles Chargers. Let's a big Friday report day, yes, though. So like we're huge. recording on Thursday. You definitely check in on the report tomorrow that'll be the most telling for guys like deandre hopkins christian fulton and tier tart then we can move on to some titans transactions here not much to say except that jordan ruse has been released from the practice squad to make room for jacques 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 yeah i want to say jacques man i know it that's how sense. i read it too uh, <laughs> jacques patrick signed to the practice squad here so they add a little bit of running back depth there yep. Uh, not much to report there, but then we can move on to wardrobe check. Ladies and gentlemen, we're bringing them back. Thank you. Uh, Rich's report. And Jim Wyatt. Jim Wyatt. Um, the Titans will be decked out in white jerseys with navy blue britches and all navy socks in Sunday's game versus the Chargers, a classic look against the Chargers team. This is one of my favorite uniform looks, I think, matchups. I think if, if for the Titans, that if, is the Titans. And then if the Chargers do end up using their like the baby blue, powder the baby blues. blue with yeah. yellow it might mm -hmm. be. Super nice. So a lot that of is, blue on the field. Yes, there will be. A lot of blue be, and yes. red and yellow. All right, that is producer JT with the news. And that leaves us with just one segment to get to today before Thursday night football kicks off in about 25 minutes. It's the best bet gauntlet. Reminder of how this works. JT and I each week go back and forth picking five a piece of our favorite sides in the NFL slate 
from that week. We lock in some lines earlier in the week via our social media if we think that the line is going to move. So on Tuesday or Wednesday, you may see us tweeting out, I'm taking this line because of this reason. I'm taking this line because and of this reason. And we do reason. take them. And like, we do we're, we're, do that. We're putting, yes. we're putting the money down on them. Yeah. So like, if you want to follow along and make money with us, which last season, 59%, a, an absolute barn burner of a season from a betting perspective to start the year. We are 60%, six and four as a, as a collective, each going three and two. And because of that, JT, we tie in week one. You, of course, lost last year. It means the tee box is still yours, my friend. Where are you going with your first pick of week two? So my first pick this week is going to be the Colts, who are actually now underdogs at plus one and a half. I'm taking them here. Um, division dog. Division dog on the road here. But here's why I'm, I'm really doing this. One, I think Anthony Richardson kind of, surprised me and a lot of people last week with how well he played and honestly didn't surprise me quarterback one <laughs> don't want to talk about it um i've been i've been trying to tell you at this point i don't you really have to but you. i've been trying not even a lot of design runs for him he passed the ball really well he ran the ball really well and i think this colts team might be a little better with him there than people thought i thought the offensive line played better pretty, sooner right yes. like people expected him to out of the gate struggle it wasn't the case in week one and they're going up against a Houston Texans team, which while they did play the the Baltimore Ravens close, right? They still did lose twenty five to nine. Like they, they still gave up a bunch of points. And so while how good this defense is, I'm still taking Anthony Richardson to get his first win against a divisional opponent. I think they're the better coach team currently. Um, even against D'Amico Ryan's, I think Shane Steichen in that offense is going to be a lot more productive than CJ Stroud can this week. A couple trends that I'm also using to back this pick in week two, the Colts are 12 and eight against the spread in the last 20 years and five and one against the spread since 2017. And then also when two winless teams play like the Colts and the Houston Texans this week, the underdog is 67, 37 and four against the spread mm. since 2005. Mm. So Give me the Colts this week. I think in a basically what I'm considering a pick 'em, I like the Colts to win. Interesting. Interesting selection. I uh, can't say I agree with that pick. Interesting. I'm I'm gonna be the homer of the week. You took Tennessee last week. I'll, I'll take Tennessee this it week. It worked for you. I'm hoping it works for me as well. I'm taking Tennessee plus three as a home dog, hosting the Chargers, of course. Pretty straightforward. We love home dogs. We love getting that three point full field goal. It won't get north of three, I don't think. Um, I don't, I'd be shocked. I'd be surprised. If maybe a, if the a, DeAndre I was, Hopkins I was kind news. of thinking that the public would come in. Maybe, maybe DeAndre Hopkins being out combined with public love for the Chargers in this game will get it to that three and a half. So keep an eye on it. Maybe bet it now, but be willing to put some more on it if you can get a game day three and a half. I don't think it will at this point based on, on the amount. It's, it's already been bet heavily this week. And it's not moved. I think the books know that if it gets to three and a half, it's going to be slammed by the big money betters and the sharps on that Tennessee side. But yeah, Mike Vrabel as a home dog in his career, eight and four. That is a very profitable record. That is straight up and against the spread. So maybe you just take Tennessee money line here. Looking at the Action Network tracking stats, sharp moves, sharp sharp actions, which is uh, their their way of tracking big money bets from syndicates and betting services, the, the people that do this for a living and make money off of it. 14 to nothing, leaning towards the Titans. Sharps love this bet this week. And uh, the big money also on the Titans, a plus 16% differential between bet percentage and money spent on the Titans. So give me Tennessee, give me Mike Vrabel, coaching mismatch, bounce back game, two teams that both need a win. The Titans need one a little bit more, in my opinion. I think that they get one here, and I think they certainly cover plus three at home. Yeah, with my next pick here, another one that we kind of sniped earlier this week, I'm going with KC minus three, headed to Jacksonville. And I think this one really comes down, not a lot of trends to this one, except that with Chris Jones finally back, with Travis Kelsey looking very very pretty much certain that he's going to play this right. week. Um, they're just the better team. We talked all offseason how this Jags defense is pretty underwhelming. I'm expecting Patrick Mahomes to have a bounce back game, especially for Andy Reid here. Yep. Andy Reid, who doesn't lose a lot of games, like coming back to get this game. I think they're. I think it's going to be a shootout, but I think they win by more than three, especially with Travis Kelsey back. I'm expecting a massive performance out of both of them. Not to say Trevor Lawrence won't ha also have a big game, but I like the Chiefs to come out 
by more than three in this one. Yeah, that's the spot. It's a very sharp bet this week. I, I like that. I was going to take it if you didn't. Uh, my second bet, I'm going to do Buffalo giving eight and a half points hosting the Vegas Raiders this week. Buffalo minus eight and a half. A couple of reasons why, and this is why I love betting weeks two, three, and four, because you're getting to fade the noise, fade the overreactions from week one, a ton to fade here, right? You've got the fact that there were big overreactions for both of these teams in completely different directions in week one. Vegas getting a massive win against a divisional opponent. Buffalo getting a massive prime time. I mean, I love betting teams coming off of a prime time loss because the public is so out on them. And that was the biggest, most embarrassing way they could have lost that game against Zach Wilson in Monday Night Football. This is still the Buffalo Bills. Yes. They are still one of the best teams in the league, in my opinion. They're still my pick to win the Super Bowl. And they still have Josh Allen, who is an up-and-down quarterback, to be sure. But at his best, he's top two or three quarterback in the league. This is exactly the kind of game you expect to see him come back with a, with a, a big response. Um, they're at home. They're facing what I consider to be a bad Las Vegas team. Uh, I, I think this number should be in the 10 territory. And as long as you can get it at eight and a half, I, I love it. This Raiders defense is weak. I think that it's, it's the, the difference between what Buffalo faced in that jets defense and what they're going to see in the Raiders defense this week is going to be like going from college to, to high school level um, resistance defensively. And then offensively that Vegas offense with Jimmy G last week against Denver, they faced really no pressure at all. Buffalo's front is going to pressure Jimmy G and he's not historically the best under pressure. Here's a number for you. Josh Allen, of his 53 career wins, 37 of those wins were by more than seven points. When he wins, he wins big. And so if you think he's going to win in this game, and I do, I think that he's going to win big. I think it's going to be a big response game for the Bills. Give me the Bills covering. I think that they win by at least 10 points, if not some serious blowout potential. I like them minus eight and a half. It's a good one, but and like you said here, this week is all about okay, who is the teams that are getting way overhyped? Right. This this the, after week one. Fade the hype. Fade the hype, and that's exactly what I'm doing here with Seattle. Currently, they're yeah. they're they're fluctuating between five and five and a half. If I can get the extra point, I'm going to take it. But they're still at have Detroit plus, at plus five. They're at Detroit. So this two week. teams again with completely opposite uh, week one performances and perceptions at this point. Yeah, and, and, and look, week two favorites of three or more after winning as a dog in week one are 38% straight up over the last 25 years. 14 not a good number. Not a, not great a number. profitable 14 number. 14 offensive points against a Chris Jones-less defense for the Detroit Lions last week. Definitely won that game with a bunch of Kadarius Tony-led luck. Yep. Um, some other trends which I like in this game, we kind of had the same exact kind of situation last season. Of course, Seattle was kind of building some hype, but still very just like speculative. And then right. Detroit, who had this hype and was like building this team, ends mm -hmm. up being a shootout. Detroit was favored in that game. It ends up being a shootout where Seattle basically leads the entire time. But week, do week two dogs off of a loss against the favorite that also was a dog last week. We said straight up, but also 40, 48 and 25 against the spread which is good for 65%. And then week two road dogs off a double digit loss since 2005 are 46, 21 or 46 and 25 against the spread. Right. Good for a 61% hit mark there. I like this to be another shootout, but I think Seattle gets back on track. I get the concerns with the offensive line, but once again, that offensive line is not going up against Aaron Donald this week. This, They're going this up true. against a, a team that Gino has... Smith's not going to have to scream, oh my God, when <laughs> Aaron Donald <laughs> you, comes way, running you, up did the you middle. See that? Yeah, did you see no, Gino Smith saying, oh my God? Yeah, that's, this, what I'm, this crazy, is what I'm man. referencing. Crazy. Yeah, that's, that's that was awesome. crazy. Yeah. yeah. Did you, did you and everyone else on the internet see that? I, I yeah, did, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, cool. That, that's my pick. <laughs> yeah, all right. I, I'm going to be betting that one with you. It's That's definitely the spot for Seattle. Um, another team that is an ugly one that you just got to trust it. I'm back in Zach Wilson and the Jets this week. They're going to Dallas. They are a nine and a half point underdog. I think that you may see this get to a 10. So definitely watch over the weekend to see if this gets to the 10. But the Jets plus nine and a half at Dallas is a clear pick for me for a couple of reasons. Number one, fundamentally, whenever I see a number near or at double digits, the spread 
in a game with a sub 40 total, it's an automatic bet on the underdog for me almost every single time. When you have, when you're expected to, and in this game, 38 and a half is the, is the total. When you're expected to have 38 or 39 points scored in a game, in order for a favorite to cover a 10 point spread, they've got to score pretty much all the points. And the odds of that are very low. So you take that dog, again, not to win. I think the Jets have a 0% chance of winning this game. But I do think they have a very good chance of covering this game. Um, it's another one where you're, I'm fading that the, the the Dallas defense is as world-breaking as they looked in week one against that horrible Giants performance. Um, I, I really like what the the Jets were able to do defensively. Obviously, I think this is a battle between two of the best defenses in the league. And then offensively, I didn't hate what they were able to do with, with you know, they've still got studs in Brees Hall who looked good immediately, which was kind of shocking coming off that ACL. Um, at one point in the game was averaging like 50 yards per carry. And then you, you've got still a very serviceable receiving core up there. Garrett Wilson, still a stud. He's able to pick off <laughs> uh, passes that are yes. intended for him that were going to be interceptions, but he picks them off and, and gets the touchdown. So Zach Wilson just needs to get in his vicinity and I'm going to be uh, comfortable with that matchup. So yeah, give me the jets plus nine and a half for all of those, those reasons. I think it's a big week. One is a liar spot. Um, I also think that with Rogers down a team like the jets that because of that could have their spirit broken and their season ruined. It's not broken yet, right? I think it's going to be a big, let's do it for Aaron game. High spirited, high effort game from them. A lot of energy, but and still I, no I, way they can win. Yeah, I give it a two. I give it a one point two percent chance. Hey, that's one point two percent more 1%, than you just said. One point two percent. We'll take it. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I but like I'm that. looking for the cover there. Looking yeah, for the cover, not lot, hoping for the win. A lot of points on that one, especially with how good that Jets defense is. So I like that one there. My next one here, I'm taking Baltimore plus three and a half. And now this is two bets that last week you had the Cleveland one, but this yeah. week. I have the Ravens, another one where I'm riding against my hometown team here. But look, and when it's, I get, your, it's your second division dog pick, which again, is. we just fundamentally we're big on the division dogs. We are. And if I can get a divisional dog, especially in the AFC North, that's over a field goal, I'm taking it. Right. These games are always ugly. Like even though both these teams offensively were not very good in their, in their week one games, I don't see that kind of, going the opposite way now and this being a shootout, AFC North teams always play each other so close. Right. And I think Lamar Jackson really does have a chance to kind of get back on the winning side of it and get a win here. Lamar Jackson, just based on trends here over the past two seasons, he's a perfect 5-0 and against the spread as an underdog. Mm. And for his career, he's 10-2 and against the spread as an underdog. And even that past then, John Harbaugh is one of the best coaches in the first two weeks as an as a against the spread, at least in weeks one and two, Harbaugh is 21 and 10 against the spread all time. Best coach against the spread in the NFL in those two weeks. Wow. Give me in just with all the circumstances right now between these two teams. I like this game to be close. So I'm taking the underdog side of it with the Ravens. I didn't love this one. It was, a, it was at a three for most of the week. Now you're getting that hook with Baltimore. They just seem to lose by a field goal or better. Um, you can see it coming down to a field goal, either if it's Justin Tucker or Evan McPherson. It feels like a game yeah. that is won by three points one way or another. It, it, taking the Cincinnati number I had last week, just to further bolster your point here, and adding on their week one performance, they are now in weeks one and two in the last three seasons, one and four. They are a, a slow starting team with Joe Burrow in this cast of characters, so that would not shock me at all if Baltimore wins outright. My fourth pick in the week two best bet gauntlet is a, maybe the scariest one for me. I'm taking taking Russ to ride with the Denver Broncos covering the three and the hook. I'm taking Denver minus three and a half versus Washington. And I did forget real quick. I what? forgot Joe Burrow got a haircut this he, week. He did get oh, a haircut. Shoot. That's concerning I for you. Did not think about that. Thank you, doc in yeah. the comments saying, but Bo, <laughs> Joe Burrow got a haircut. Yeah, I did. did not think about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe then. he's like Samson in the Bible. You cut the hair and the, and the powers are gone. I'm not um, sorry to interrupt. You. Maybe, just, maybe it's that, the that's opposite. An important, yeah. That's an important detail. That is, it, well, he, we at least have a reason. We have something we can blame it on if, if the bet True. doesn't cash. Okay. It's because go. he got yeah, a haircut, yeah. right? Yeah. So we've got an we out there. We can and void that one. Right. Um, so <laughs> God. my fourth pick, uh, Denver minus three and a half. They are hosting Washington. Historically, Denver, very good, especially early in the season, at home, at elevation in mile high. Teams just aren't all the way up to football conditioned yet. Um, so it helps for them to have that altitude advantage, that acclimation advantage. Sam Howell, 
quarterback for the, the, the commanders is a sack magnet. I'm a fan of him generally and what he may can become, but he invites a lot of pressure, invites a lot of sacks. He cannot keep himself clean, which is concerning against a Denver defense that, as I mentioned earlier in the gauntlet, did not get any pressure in week one. It's the reason why I think they're going to be much better in week two. We saw last year, this defense absolutely has the, the horses. They have the, no pun intended, they've got the horses to be a fantastic unit. I think that this is a big bounce back spot for them. They talked a lot of mess. Nick Chubb and those, not Nick Chubb, um, Bradley Chubb and those guys talked a lot of mess week one about how they were excited to, to face the Raiders. They lose, they get embarrassed. I think they come back with a vengeance this week. Jerry Judy is a guy that was reportedly close to going in week one. I think he's maybe an impact in week two. So Russ will have a field stretcher, an X play, explosive play guy at his disposal. Washington barely beat Arizona last week. I think that Arizona obviously is a horrible team. I think Washington is a bad team. And I think on the road that this is just a, 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 a bad spot for them against a Sean Payton that is hot after a loss, not looking to go 0-2. I think it's a pretty serious coaching mismatch. I, I like R Riverboat Ron, but more as a meme than as an actual coach. I think that Sean Payton's much better. Um, so I just I like everything about the spot, and it, I like it so much. I can't believe I'm saying it. I'm going to take Russ to cover the field goal and the hook. I think that they win by a, a touchdown in this game. Give me Denver minus three and a half. And I would I would ride with you on that one if, if Bradley Chubb was still on the Broncos. Or oh, who am I talking about then? It wasn't Bradley Chubb. I, um, I, I didn't see this, but I just ah uh, no, up. that that's fair. Yeah, he's a dolphin now, isn't he? Um, he is. uh, shoot, I'll let you think of it. Let yeah, me, I'm let gonna me go think on my of last it. one because I, I was re I, I know somebody was talking a lot of mess because a, a, a Raiders article I read was mm -hmm. making fun of them. So now speaking I have to go of it. Bradley Chubb playing on the Dolphins, yeah, my last pick for the best bet gauntlet. You take those fins. I'm gonna take those fins and spit in the face of all of you sharp betters out there because you know what. Last season, everyone told me, do not go against the, the Patriots on prime time. They're playing the Bills. So it's going to be a close game. And then the Bills blow them out. Killed them, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't care how sharp this line is. I just really like the Miami Dolphins to continue what they are doing um, against this New England team this week. And here's some stats that I just really like about this team. First of all, I understand Bill Belichick as a rare home dog. I get it. Randy I Gregory. Randy, Randy Gregory. That's what I was thinking of. I get it. He's a great home dog. However, he's 11 and four as a home dog with other all other quarterbacks he's ever had. He's one and five against the spread as a home dog with Mac Jones, which Not is great. my first Not red great. flag. My second red flag for so that's basically a Tom Brady Mac Jones split. It is. It is. A, it is a, a Tom still Brady a fair, Mac still a Jones split. However, QBs four and zero against the spread or better versus New England under Bill Belichick. Go as follows. Eli Manning, 5-0 against the spread. Mm, Geno good. Smith, 4-0 against the spread somehow. And then Tua. The hoodie four, killer, yes. Geno Smith. And then Tua Tagovailoa, 4-0 against the spread against New England under Belichick. I like it right now at only minus three. I think the connection between Tua and Tyreek continues. I think this is just a way better offense than what New England can muster up. Okay. I'm going to take the Dolphins, minus three this week. All right. Um... You know, I'm going to I'm going to make my fifth and final selection in the week 2 best bet gauntlet our first head to head bet of the year. I'm going back to your first bet. I'm going to take the other side of that Indy Houston game. Give me Houston all minus that, all that AR talk and yeah, now you I, now I know. I know. Listen, I think he's going to be good in the game, don't get me wrong. But mm -hmm. here's the reason why I'm willing to lay Houston at home. They're I think they're going to win by a field goal. I think that this Houston defense is legit. What I saw against Baltimore, I liked I, that's the only other game besides the Titans that I actually dug, dug into some all 22 from this week and watched some breakdowns on. And I was a fan of what I saw. I think that they are serious and they're going to present. I really do think a significantly bigger challenge to this Colts team than what you saw from that Jaguars defense, which as I've made very clear, I hate, I think that their defense is very bad and overrated. I think this, this Houston defense is much better and CJ Stroud looked fine to me in that game. I thought that he looked better than I expected. Kind of a sneaky, fine game from him. He didn't look overwhelmed a whole lot. He looked to be in control and just limited. I think that he's going to only get better. And the other reason, the biggest reason why I'm big into this game is because it's it's the sharp side in, in this game. The the according to the Action Network metrics on this, sharp betters love Houston in this Bring spot. It on. They love yeah, Bring you are you are and you are you are riding with the public. You are riding with the squares twice this week, which listen, the public wins 40% of the time. So, you know, 
it's, it's about 40 percent of my bets this week so. it, it's exa- actually exactly 40 wow. percent of your bets this week Quick funny bet. how that works so yeah give me houston that is our best bet gauntlet and that is the end of our very long show today to recap our best bet gauntlet jt and i going head to head he's taking indianapolis plus one and a half i'm taking houston giving one and a half and then jt is taking kansas city minus three on the road seattle plus five and a half on the road baltimore plus three and a half on the road and miami giving three on the road i'm going to take tennessee plus three at home against the chargers buffalo giving eight and a half against vegas the jets plus nine and a half at dallas denver minus three and a half hosting the Washington Commanders. We're getting so much better at this because it's no longer one of us taking all favorites and the other one taking dogs. This, this is, is true. This is more. I, I feel good about this season. There are, about uh, this season. There's only there's only three, four favorites. You said 40% of our bets are favorites and 60% are dogs. We are riding with the ugly dogs in week two, and historically, that pays off. We are done for today. Appreciate everybody tuning in with us live. We'll be here at Boom Bus Pizza in Spring Hill watching the Eagles and the Vikings. Who you got in that game? I mean, not to win, but I think the Vikings line, plus six and a half. Yeah, Vikings six and a half. I think I think well, I'm as gonna... Logan says, you should do the Boom Boss beer bet. You pick one item for the Thursday night football game and bet opposite sides of it. One I do like one prop, one I, one prop, one line. OK, I don't know. well, going forward, we can we can uh, we, actually you know what? We, the game starts in two minutes. So what, do you like it. the under them in this game? Because I will take the over. What's the over under 49? Um. Sure, why not? For the okay. for the fun of the game. Okay. For the fun of the game, I'll take the under. You'll take the over. Well, I'll take the over. That, sure. That's the that's the Thursday night beer bet of the game. And somebody's getting a drink. Uh, I guess at the end of the night, if it takes forever for them to score all the points. So we probably, so. yeah, we we'll probably should have thought out the, the cool. nature of that bet, but um appreciate you guys listening. We'll be here at Boom Buzz all season long on Thursday nights. So We'd love for you to come and hang out. We gotta get to the bar and watch this game and eat some delicious food and drink some delicious drinks. Uh, make sure you're subscribed, rating, reviewing. Following us on social media at Hot Repod, all that good mess. We'll be back on Monday after the Titans' home opener against the Chargers, breaking down the winners and losers from their Week Two game. We'll see what we can uh, surmise from this team in Week Two. Now that we have, we'll have double the sample size on them come Monday morning. We'll record on Sunday evening live, so I, well, maybe we'll be live. If we're live, catch us on social media. If not. Catch us first thing Monday morning. Either way, we will talk to you then. Have a fantastic weekend. For producer JT, I'm your host, Easton Freeze. This has been the Hot Read Podcast. We'll talk to you next week.